All right. Well, we are in the book of Ephesians. I believe this is, I, I don't even want to guess the number of weeks because I'm bad with numbers, uh, as you'll hear in just a minute. But we're, I think we're week 10 right now. Nine. Oh, what? Eleven. My wife. Eleven. Eleven. Um, so we're in week 11. My paper says, I wrote, hand wrote my note. It says week nine, um, which is perfect. It goes into my kind of opener for this. But um, one of the questions we're asking today is how will the world see, the, see Christ through the church? In case we hadn't realized, um, the reality is that Jesus Christ ascended to heaven and we, the church, are left as his only witness to the gospel. So the question is relevant. How will we, the people of God, reveal Christ to the world? How will the world see the Lord Jesus Christ through the lives we live? Because that is what gives witness to him and lets people know that Christ is risen, alive, and still transforming lives. We have to ask this question and understand that the answer is pretty easy when you just look at it on paper. We're to live as Christ lived. I mean, it's easy until you try it, right? Here's the thing that really kind of shook me up when I was looking at this. With what the Apostle Paul says, we can recognize in Ephesians 4 that he calls us to a life that has a a certain set of like realities to it. Absolutes. Um, I've learned absolutes the hard way. Um, When I was young, I was math shamed and I was never good at math, but then I had a, a magical math teacher in sixth grade. I don't want to say his name because people in my hometown, uh, some of the people do watch this podcast, and I would hate for Mr. Hurley to get beat up. So, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so I, I was not good. He would call me up to the board and have me do problems knowing I was going to tank them, and he just kind of made comments, and I thought, one day, dude, when I'm bigger, you're going down, you're going to take a dirt nap, you know, but it never happened, um, and I've forgiven him, kind of. Um, but, but really, uh, I, I struggled with math, and, and it came to its fullest fruition when I was in college math. Uh, Erica and I were in the same math class, and I sat down to do math. I don't like it. It's not good. And I sat down, there's like a seven, and then a parenthesis next to it, which I was like, that's weird. And then some other numbers with symbols in between, another parenthesis, and then some other stuff, an N. I'm like, uh, go back to English. And... Um, <laughs> And I kind of kicked that one out, and then something else, and then an equal sign. So I was just like, all right, seven plus whatever these numbers are, and I'm going to just say, that one says minus, so I'm going to take you away, see you in, see you nader, <laughs> and I boot it off, and then, uh, and then I came up with 18. Walk up, you know, Eric's like, did you do your math? I'm like, yeah, check it out. And she's like, oh, oh, what'd you do? I was like, as far as I know, I did math. And she's like, no, math has rules. You can't just do it your way. You can't be like, I decide this is math and do it your way and, and get a trophy. You know, you can't get your math ribbon or a grade or whatever doing that. And she sat down and she taught me, like, apparently you have to do the parentheses first and the N actually mattered and all this other stuff. She showed me and then I got my answer. I was like, well, that's not 18. And she taught it to me over and over again. And I just realized I didn't like the rules of math. I didn't believe in them. That didn't change the rules of math. Math is, right? Math simply has rules. You have to follow them if you want to get the right answer. In the, in the Christian faith, there is a reality and an absolute truth that Jesus Christ simply is, whether or not people believe in him. It doesn't affect his lordship if you don't believe, if you don't cast your life onto him and allow redemption to flow into your life, it doesn't change that, the, that it was offered to you freely and Christ is the high king of heaven. It, it, your belief in him doesn't change him. What it does, your belief actually, when you participate with God on his terms in faith, you're redeemed in Christ Jesus and you are filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again, so that your life becomes a living, transformed symbol of Christ's life. And we've talked about this a lot. There are certain basic rules in the Christian faith. Jesus Christ is the only way. And I know I've heard it in so many different settings. God's like a mountain. There are many ways up. You can take that idea and flush it. It's a lie. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man comes to the Father except by me. If Jesus said that, I'm going to hold on. God's not a mountain. He's not a mountain. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're invited to know God and be made into his image through the blood of Christ. So what we recognize is there's some absolutes. But we also get the nuance of our lives. See, if we try to become like Jesus, we become these moralistic, religious, kind of abusive people who look at other people and think, well, at least I've got my life together more than they do. And that's not Christianity either. Paul's going to talk to us today from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 32. And in this text, he lays out what I believe is the best picture of what it means or how the church can really reveal Christ to the world around them. Follow along as we read this. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Let's just stop right there real quick. Ephesians were not in the bloodline of Christ, so or in the bloodline of Abraham. They were outside of the Jewish covenant. They were Gentiles, but you know, notice how Paul uses wildly inclusive language. He's saying, don't be like the Gentiles. He's now saying, you're grafted in. You're part of this family now by the blood of Christ. We go on. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, meaning it promises one thing and delivers another. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing, must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands and that they may have the opportunity to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only, as, only what is helpful in building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ Jesus and God forgave you. That little section right there is like trying to take a quarter beef and eat it whole. That is hard to get down. But if we take a minute and we kind of butcher this thing up right, it becomes a beautiful thing that you really enjoy, a porterhouse, right? And if you're a vegan, try one. Trust me, you'll be like, he's the greatest. He was right. But um, <laughs> this, is, this is tough. This is tough to understand because it's a big chunk. But we're going to cut it down to size and make it digestible for us. What we have to do is take a moment and understand that the answer to the question for us of how we reveal Christ is actually answering a different question, kind of the inverse. Instead of asking, how do we glorify Christ, let's take a look at maybe what we're doing that doesn't and recognize what keeps us from living like Christ is pretty basic. It's a hardened heart. It's a hardened heart. Think of like a piece of scrap iron, hard. It's just a hardened heart, and you think, well, great. What do we do with that? How do, we, how do we understand that? Well, thankfully, we're named after a foundry, so we're gonna talk about it. We're the foundry church. People say, why are you the foundry church? Because I believe in the process of foundries. Has anybody here ever been to a foundry? Yeah, filthy hot places, aren't they? Man, it's crazy. Steel melts at 2,500 degrees. Wrought iron melts at 2,700. Tungsten steel melts at 6,150, I think. And the sun called. It wants its rays back. Like, that's hot, right? That's insanely hot. A foundry is a place where you take scrap 
useless things. You put it into a pot and you turn the heat to it. And the heat gets that metal molten and glowing and bubbly and liquid. A hard, brittle, like just hardened thing becomes soft and malleable. It becomes liquid. It can be formed into anything. And the foundry takes that liquid metal, pours it into a mold, and repurposes what was once hard and brittle and held in its shape is now repurposed into a different shape. How good of an image is that for the church? That is a really good image because the foundry, the foundry is this hot, loud, dynamic place with people moving everywhere, molten metal pouring, glowing steel, all this different stuff. It's crazy what's going on in there. The hissing of, of the slag hitting the, the cooling pots. It's just loud and dirty. Has anybody ever driven through Gary, Indiana? Uh, you go on the toll road there to Chicago, and you see the big U.S. steel foundries out there just billowing their healthy air out. And it's like, oh, man, look at that. What's going on is a foundry. Something inside is being completely transformed. When our hearts are hard, we need to understand we are like that scrap iron. We are like that scrap iron. And our hardened hearts will allow things to go on in and around us that would typically lose or, or hurt a softened heart. We've kind of lost feeling. We're hard and we're brittle. And what happens with that is this tragic reality that um, a hardened heart, things just bounce off. But a soft heart, that's why I had Abby share about uh, her experience in uh, in the dumps in Africa, where these children and families live, that's their life, and it implodes in. And oftentimes, we will sit back and care nothing about this. I will guarantee you this. Very few of you will go home and put on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or Snap that 17 people died a few weeks ago in Africa at a garbage dump. But many of you will go online and post, hail, we wanted a buzzer beater. We miss the gospel for the most pointless things. Now, I'm not saying the games aren't fun in that. I'm, please don't get me wrong. I'm a sportsaholic. I love it. But the reality is, this is the gospel. And our hearts should be soft to what's going on to people who bear the image of God in this world and people who are hurting. We have to look up and realize that a hardened heart is more of a weapon than it is a tool of God's kingdom. And we can't live in that. We can't live as people who refuse to let the work of the foundry take place. So what we need to do is just sit back and have a moment of diagnosis. We need to diagnose what are the signs of a heart that has grown hard. And then you can measure for yourself what's going on. You can look and see if a hardened heart is part of what is living inside of you. The first thing we know is this. Out of Ephesians chapter 4, if we have a hardened heart, the reality is we won't open up to people. We won't open up. There'll be very little connectivity. The apostle Paul actually wrote a letter to another church in the city of Corinth. He wrote two letters, First and Second Corinthians, and he wrote this to him, and, and Paul says this. Now, I want you to think, like, ladies, if you've ever gotten a note from a guy and it was especially loving, and you're like, oh, it's like he showed me his heart. You know, and you feel good about it. Any girls ever get one of those? Oh, <sighs> I have paper in my office and pens, men. All right. Um, the Apostle Paul didn't struggle as many of us do in this room. He wrote this to the people in Corinth. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding affection, but you are. As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open up. Open up. Paul is saying to them that not opening up is a dangerous reality. It means that people who are trying to connect are hitting what? A hard piece of metal and they're bouncing off it. They're not connecting. Have you ever been in a store or a restaurant and you see like an older couple sitting there and uh, the husband looks particularly miffed at something? He's just He's got a no face, you know, just, hey, no, you know, he just kind of looks angry. I love those kind of people, and I follow them in stores because it's awesome. And uh, you, you see him, and the, the wife is walking, she's like, you know, what's wrong? I don't know, Hank, we'll call him Hank. What's wrong, Hank? And he's, nothing. Something happened at work? No. Did the kids call you and tell you what kind of father you've been? No. What? <laughs> you know, 
seemed odd. You know, do, do you want this? Do you, do you want this kind of meal? It's fine. And she kind of goes, will you stop and tell me what's wrong? Will you let me in? Will you let me connect with you? And please stop mumbling under your breath and grunting when I speak to you? Sure. And she's like, well, fine. And then this weird silence goes over them, and they just walk through the store, eerie silence. That's where I'm like, and I'm done following you creepy people, and I just take my card elsewhere. But they're like, here's the laundry detergent, and they throw it in there, and they're making a bit of a ruckus because they won't let each other in to see what's actually hurting them. The signs of a hard heart can quite often be the fact that we don't let people connect with us. We don't let people in. The second thing is this. You won't take anyone's advice. Have you ever been in a, have you ever seen somebody who's in a situation, let's take a dad, Eric, and his teenage son, Josh, and uh, we're driving in Chicago, and I'm going somewhere, and, and I, I know Chicago pretty well, and I'm super terrible driving um, person, and so I'm driving along, and I'm just zipping around and having a blast, and Josh's like, we need to turn here. Why don't you tell me where I need to go? You know, when I was changing your diaper, I was also driving in this city. Beep, beep, beep. None of it. Just won't take advice. But, Dad, the GPS is a liar. And I am in control. Don't disturb me. You know, and off you go. You won't take advice. You won't listen to anybody. It is your way or the highway. And everybody around you is too foolish to give counsel into your life. It's a sign of a, of a hardened heart when you won't take advice. And Exodus chapter 7 speaks of this. It actually, I think, verse 22 and 23, way back in the Old Testament, there is this king and ruler named Pharaoh, and God is speaking to him through Moses and Aaron, Moses' brother, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, and it says he hardened his heart and wouldn't take the counsel of Moses and Aaron, and his entire nation came to ruin because of the hardness of his heart, and he would not take counsel. If you're above instruction, advice, or guidance, you have an issue with a hardened heart. Third thing is this, if your love has grown cold. This is always frightening to me. In Matthew, um, Matthew chapter 7, we have a situation where, where Jesus is unfolding what things will look like later in, in, in the future. And what he says is, and I encourage you, if you get a chance to read Matthew 7, 10 through 14, and really get a, a broader picture. But in Matthew 7, 12, Jesus says this, as wickedness grows, so love grows cold. Like, think about this. As wickedness grows, your love will turn cold, which means this. If your love has turned cold, there's some kind of wickedness on the increase within you. And it's hardening your heart from hearing from God, connecting with people, taking advice. It's, it's growing in there, and it's a dangerous reality. One of the funnest ways I can think of pointing this out is my wife, because that seems healthy. And, um, and Erica, Erica is a singular snack person. She kind of picks a snack that she likes. Started with the Mocha Chip Blizzard. Is that the right name? Mocha Chip. And um, she liked the Mocha Chip Blizzard. And this is back when we had babies, like little kids. And um, I, I went to Dairy Queen, like, so randomly. Do you think DQ's still open? Can I, do you want a Blizzard? And I'm like, no. I would rather close my hand in the door than drive to Dairy Queen and get food. But I'm going. And I would, off I would go. For a mocha chip blizzard, it was her love. And I'll never forget the day her love turned cold for a mocha chip blizzard. I said, do you want one of those? She's like, oh, no. It's like it grew a mustache. I'm like, what's wrong with a mocha chip blizzard? I don't know. I'm just kind of over it. And then she did it to the Tommy Turtle. <laughs> now, we can blame it on the pecans because she's allergic and there was a swelling issue with her throat. But... Um, <laughs> But she had, she had changed out, you know, pecans for the, the Captain Crunchies, and that was the thing. And that was the thing for quite a while. Right now, it's coffee, coffee, buzz, 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 which I think Ben and Jerry's has quit making. And so I am currently searching the greater regions of Vermont to try to get it shipped to us because Erica is loyal to one kind of treat. It starts in the summer, follows her around through a year, and then she dumps it like a bad high school boyfriend. Get out, you know. I'm so glad I'm not a Sunday. <laughs> I would be nervous. I would be nervous if I was made of ice cream, which, by the way, I partly am. Um, but she just gets over it and moves on. Your love grows cold. You can move on without feeling. You can be like, 
you're dead to me, and just walk off. That's the sign of a hard heart. Fourth thing is this, you cannot be happy for someone else. You cannot be happy for someone else. The reality is, when we quit being able to celebrate other people's success or joys or blessings in life, it's a sign of a hard heart. Remember the movie Fun with Dick and Jane when Jim Carrey was in the elevator with his buddy Oz and they're talking about the business and uh, the company they're in, Globodyne, and they're, they're working in this place and they're going up to where they work on the 22nd floor. The elevator opens and Oz walks out and Jim Carrey, his character, stays in the elevator. And Oz doesn't know that Jim Carrey's been called to the top floor to be promoted to vice president. And he says, hey, c- come on. And he goes, not this time, Oz. And when the doors close, he lo- Oz is like, oh, come on. And he like throws his briefcase at the elevator door like, that was my promotion. That's what I wanted. I, it, it leaks of envy. Not only does he want what he got, he also doesn't want him to have it. When you can't be happy for someone else's blessings or good things in life, there's signs of a hardened heart inside of you, and it's frightening. Paul would lift people up. He took outsiders, they called them Gentiles, and he turned them into insiders. He grafted them into the body of Christ because what did Jesus do first? He took Paul, who persecuted the church and was there when they martyred people and killed people for their faith in Jesus, and he raised Paul up from the murderer, the person who persecuted and hurt the church into its greatest evangelistic disciple and the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. What we recognize is that Paul followed in Jesus' footsteps, lifting those up around him, even at great personal expense to himself. It's important that we have the ability to celebrate with people who are celebrating and celebrate what's going well. The fifth thing is this, and this is the thing that frightens me the most, when you don't feel anything. When you stop feeling anything, it's a scary sign. It's a scary sign that says your heart has gone hard, it has gone cold, and when you lose feeling, you begin to disconnect from what other people are enduring. Scripture talks uh, extensively about a disease called leprosy, Um, and you think, okay, that's a biblical thing, but it's actually not just biblical. It's largely eradicated um, in the developed world, but do you know in the United States of America, we still have an active leper colony? It's on the island of Molokai in the Hawaiian chain of islands. And there's an active leper colony where people with leprosy live because back in the day, people thought they had a bacterial, didn't know it that way, just an infectious skin disease. But what leprosy actually is is quite frightening and it's connected to this. Leprosy is the loss of feeling in your extremities. And it's why people with leprosy are literally falling apart. Not because... The limbs have grown grown like necrotic with feeling, but because they can burn their hands severely and pull it back and have grill marks on it and blisters and not feel a thing. So they don't know that the infection that's racing through their hands is going to cause their hand to grow necrotic and their fingers to fall off because they don't feel anything. And they literally start falling apart physically. A small injury turns to an infected cut. An infected cut goes gangrene through the hand and arm, and eventually their arm falls away. Leprosy is not an infection. It's the loss of feeling. The loss of feeling. When we no longer feel what God feels for this world, when we no longer desire what God desires for this world, because there's no feeling of connectedness with God. The reality is we become necrotic. And I have heard more than once in my office, I feel like my life is falling apart. And I'm like, it's because there's no feeling. Because you have done, as Paul said, grieve the Holy Spirit and driven the Spirit of God out of your life by your actions. Because, well, we can go back through it, couldn't we? We could go right back through this list. And understand that for us, the reality is we don't always open up to people. We don't want to be in a small group in church. I don't want to be known. You don't want anyone's advice. You don't lo- your love for God or for people has grown cold. You're not happy for others. And in the, in the end, you just grow completely without feeling. And this is something you do once a week. 
God, may it never be so that we become that kind of church. That we would be people who lost not only the feeling, but the actual tingling life in our extremities to do the work of the kingdom and hurt where God hurts and feel what God feels. We have to be able to do that. And the way we do that is quite painful. We have to become people who are refined. There's a scripture back in the Psalms that speaks of this. Psalm 26, 2 and 3 says it this way. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love, and I have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. That word, that first thing, test me. That, that phrase actually says this. Smelt me. Put me into the furnace in a foundry. Throw me the scrap heap of life in there and purify me. Here's the crazy reality of what it is to be refined in the fires of a foundry. You put scrap into it, and it breaks down to this molten state. Remember that? But here's the neat thing that happens. Once it's fully liquefied, the metal settles to the bottom, and the dross or the slag, the impurities, come to the surface. And someone comes through with a a slag screen, and they scoop out the impurities from the metal, and they refine it. They make it pure, and then they put it into the mold that it becomes repurposed, reimagined, and eventually reborn. How legit is that for a metaphor for us? That God will put us into his fire. David said, test me, melt me down, and remove from me what is filthy, what is broken, what is sinful, and refine me, make me pure. Just think with me. Do you sit in this place today and say, Eric, you have no idea how deeply connected some of my sin issues are. I've been addicted to, attached to, owned by. Just insert the sin you are owned by. That seems not only to be in you, but woven so intricately intricately within your body that it feels like it's part of the interior marrow of the bone. And you're like, there's no way to separate from me from this sin. You're right. There's not any way for you to do it. But there is the fire of the Spirit. When we invite the Spirit of God to invade us continually and we don't grieve the Holy Spirit and we say, melt me down, change me, transform me, break me down from the state I'm in and sweep out of me every impurity. Pick up from me all that is not pleasing to you. We find ourselves being purified and refined from things that we could have never separated. You can say, I can't get this out of me. No, but he can. And he will break your life down. He will purify it. And here's the coolest part. Then he remakes you into the image of Jesus Christ. And that is how the world sees Christ through the church. Not through a bunch of religious, pious people who walk into church and are like, good morning, brother. And they're like, are they all related here? Why do they keep calling each other brother and sister? I know we're not Southern Baptist, but it still happens, right? Why, why are they so strange? They seem to act like they've got it together, but I saw half of them on St. Patty's Day at the Karah getting their green on. So what's going on here? Which one are they? Are they moralistic or are they Christian? What's going on? I will tell you this. We must be people in the flame. You cannot fix what's broken, but he will melt down and put you to the test. He will remove those things that were so deeply in you that the only way to get rid of them is to melt down the part of you that matters, and let float the things he's ready to get rid of. It's a beautiful image for the church, but it's him working on our behalf. We have to be willing to go into the fires. If we let God examine our heart and his word is like a furnace that separates the good from the impurity and the foundry purifies and repurposes, we know this, that just like Paul said, he says in this scripture, don't lie. You know, if if you're new in Christ, don't lie. Why? 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 Because we belong to each other. And to lie is to pollute the waters in which we swim. It pollutes our relationship and hardens our hearts. Don't go to bed angry with each other. That's an important reality that the church knows, that even the smallest wedge that Satan can put in between us will divide the body of Christ. And if Jesus was right, a house divided cannot stand. So forgive and love one another, and work things out with costly conversations and honesty. 
Don't steal. Sounds funny to say that. Most people, most of us are like, oh, that's fine. Maybe one person's like, oh, my word, they know, you know. But seriously, don't steal. Why? Because when you're stealing, you will miss your purposeful opportunity to do what you were made for and work. And when you steal, it's all for you. But when you work, there's part of it you just want to give away. And you'll miss the opportunity to share with those in need. We must be people who understand that God will scrape the impurities out of our life if we will submit to the life in the furnace of the Holy Spirit, living within us, convicting of us, us of sin, and transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. It's not your work, it's his. Will you submit to it? Let's apply this in three ways. First of all, I want you to ask. I want you to ask the question, is your heart hard? Is your heart hard? Just sit on it for a minute. Is your heart hardened? If it is, I want to invite you to something. I want to invite you to open it up. I want you to invite you to just open up. I'm not saying we'll be perfect. I'm not saying we won't make mistakes. But I'm telling you this. It is scary to be vulnerable in a group like this. It is scary to go into a small group and be known and known well for your strengths and your weaknesses. It is hard to be vulnerable in this life. But I believe God will protect you because he has your best interest at heart. I don't believe it'll be easy, but it will be worthwhile. You don't have to do it yourself. Lay down your pride. Lay down your envy. Lay down your identity and let God soften your heart because he will do more than you could ever imagine. That sin that once was so ingrained with your almost felt like your soul, one day you'll look up and realize that it's gone. And you'll think, oh my gosh, I'm free. I, know, I don't know that old me any more than I know the planet Mars. I know of it, but I've never been there because that's not me anymore. God does something in removing it from us. When we're connected with a soft heart, so ask yourself, do I have a soft heart? And then ask yourself this, is there any dross, slag, impurities that need to be removed? This is rhetorical, by the way. This is very rhetorical. I'm finding that I get tired of the slag removal in my life. It hurts. It's painful. I wish it didn't have to happen so often, and quite honestly, there's times it feels very discouraging when I'm like, well, Looks like that needs to die, and I thought it was great. Like, there's part of me that goes through that, and I get tired of it, but I will tell you this. We will come out of Christ's furnace, and we will look upon ourselves, and we will see the very image of him who we love, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are transformed by the removal of all our impurities, what do you think God puts in place of it? But the very image of Jesus Christ, whom he wants to make known in this world through your everyday ordinary life. He wants people to know him through you, and they don't know you know him through your moral behavior. They know him and experience him by your becoming, outside of your own power, so much more like Jesus Christ. People always follow Jesus. Why? Because his heart was open. He attached them. He loved freely. He gave of himself to the very point of death, and he's called this church to do the same thing. Go through a list of the, of the things the impurities in your life. Just be honest for a minute in your own head and heart and be like, okay, I'm gonna name it. You don't have to say it out loud, but you can just sit for a minute. I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds just to throw the list together of name some impurities going on in your life that maybe God needs to remove so that that brokenness in you can become a very reflection of the heart of God. Take a minute, think about that. Don't be depressed by what you just put on a list in your mind. It's the very thing God intends to remove from you, not by your power, but by his. Will you go into the furnace? I invite you to go into the furnace. Finally, be patient with the other hearts around you. And I mean this to say we Christians can literally be the worst. We can have, let's say we matured on from a certain vice. I'll just use gambling. Okay, so we, we used to gamble. You know, we're a terrible gambler. 
and you, you were addicted to it, it was really hard. And God, through the, through the changing of your life, has not only redeemed you from it, but he's turned you from a gambler to a very generous person who is hospitable and caring for the world around them. And you look over at somebody on their way to Gun Lake and you're like, what's wrong with you? How dare you? Don't you know what you're supposed to be? Give space for other hearts to grow. Don't ever forget they're in process just as you are. We don't have this all worked out. We are a living sacrifice to God. So it will be a little different for each one of us. But the reality is be patient with the other hearts that are learning to open up. Be patient with the other hearts that are learning to feel again. Be patient with people who don't open up easily because you don't know what abuses have sealed them off and God is slowly opening. Be kind, be gentle, and love one another with a soft heart that says, I believe the best in you because I believe God's working something out in you. Forgive others as freely as you've been forgiven in Christ Jesus. And you will find your heart inexpressibly softening and people going, not only what's different about you, but how can I become more like that? The world is tired of bitterness, brokenness, and anger. What they need is people with a soft heart who are revealing Jesus Christ. They need the church to come alive. Pray with me. God, by the power of your spirit, we ask that you would begin to refine us and break down the walls in us, that you would make new in us that which is broken. You would remove impurity, the impurities maybe we never chose that we are exposed to, or maybe the impurities we hold on to and and have as an identity. God, will you make the things in us that are impurities, will you remove them by your spirit and by the process of breaking us down And then will you replace it with the beautiful image of Jesus Christ that the world will see and know that not only is he alive, but he's at work changing the everyday ordinary lives of people into a living and glorious reflection of himself. God, may it be so of us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are not willing to grow in this, the world will not know. The world around you will not know who Jesus Christ is. Because God's work in us transforms the world around us. And I have to invite you to open up. I have to invite you to be open to critique and change and advice from fellow believers. I have to open, ask you to open up and love as freely as you've been loved. I have to ask you to start celebrating others, other people's growth, other people's satisfaction and joy even if it's at the cost of yours. I have to invite you to feel again the Spirit of God inside His church and feel what God feels for a world that is dying without Him. And He sent you here to be reminded that your life is not your own, but you were bought with a very dear price of Jesus Christ and you were filled with His Holy Spirit. Ask Him, Invite him, fill me, Holy Spirit, every moment of every day. Ask him, he'll fill you as often as you ask. Invite him so that people will see and know that the church is alive in Christ. We're not doing this in our own efforts. We are participating with God on his terms. That reality, the truth, that his only desire is that we become redeemed and giving witness to his son, Jesus Christ. It's not an easy calling. A lot of you will die off. A lot of your person will go and change as God removes impurities. But the beautiful replacement will change the world around you. It takes courage. It takes faith. And it takes a first step to say, I'm open to it. I invite you to invite the Holy Spirit to begin his work in changing this world in and through you. And as you do it, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, the church must leave the building. You're dismissed.